Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Thank you because you are instructing us and teaching us and preparing us for that coming day. We pray, Lord, you will make us like the wise virgins in Jesus' name. Amen. The spirit and the slumber of foolish virgins to take away from every one of us. Amen. Help us to be wise unto salvation. Amen. Wise to prepare you. For the coming of the Lord. Again, wake us up. Amen. Let the word, like sword, like hammer, like fire, do its work in every heart, every life, every family, in every person here today, in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. Manifest that answer in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 tells us, But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. The Lord puts a great, a precious a value on proper knowledge. Knowledge that affects life. Knowledge that transforms life. Knowledge that makes a person different from the people who do not have that knowledge. But the knowledge is revealed not in what somebody tells us. The knowledge is revealed not just in what we have heard. The knowledge is revealed not in what we store in the head. The knowledge is revealed by its manifestation, demonstration in our lives. And the ignorance he's talking about here is about something very important that affects everyone. And whether you are knowledgeable or ignorant, it will be reflected in your life. And it says, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Because this knowledge will affect your emotion. This knowledge will affect your attitude. This knowledge will affect your hope. This knowledge will affect your inner man. It will affect your relationship. It will affect your attitude to everything around you. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning them which are asleep. If you are ignorant, you will sorrow even as others that have no hope. If you have the knowledge of what you ought to have and you are not ignorant, you will not sorrow even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, if we truly believe our faith, our confidence, our trust in the Lord, will affect the inner man. What will believe? It will affect your stand, affect your standing. It will affect your outlook. If you affect your behavior, it will affect what you think about in the future, what you think about the past. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If you believe that, and you had lost a loved one, a wife, a husband, a child, a father, a mother, a beloved brother, a beloved sister, somebody very close to you, if you truly believe what you profess to believe, it will affect what you think about them. And every time the remembrance of the loss comes to you, you will not be dejected and then moody and then somebody says, Look, I saw you yesterday. What's happening to you today? The way you look today, like there's a pressure on your life in your mind. Because you don't truly believe what you thought you believed. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, then also, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That means, you know, you'll see them again. 
you recognize them again. You're looking forward to the hope of reunion, happy reunion. For this we say unto you by the watch of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. You find as Paul the Apostle was writing by the inspiration of the Spirit. He was counting on it that he will be part of the rapture. He said, this we say, we apostles. This we say, we the servants of the Lord. And we say this by the watch of the Lord. That we, we believers of that time. That's what he thought. Because nobody knows the day or the date or the time when Christ will come. Therefore, everybody was kept expecting. And the Lord has reserved that date unto himself. Why? Because if you knew the date and you know it's so far away, it's another 30 years then, you might be careless today. You might backslide today. You might yield to the pressures of life today. After all, it's 30 years time. That's why the Lord has researched that authority and that knowledge to himself that we do not know the day and the apostles thought they would be part of the rapture. If you knew the day time was very near, like it's tomorrow, you'll panic. If it's tomorrow, how can I get this settled? This settled, this settled, and that settled. And so, whether far or near, we don't know. And that keeps us on our spiritual toes that we keep on preparing. That's why it says, we say this by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, presage them, or hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, not an angel, is coming again. For the Lord himself, not a representative from heaven, he himself is coming. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's an explanation of the fact that will not precede them, prevent them. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We're talking about just something happening in a twinkling of an eye. It's not that they rise first, then they go to heaven. And then after some years, we now were raptured. No, the distance of the period of the interval between they rise in and we being cut up is tricky, a tricking of an eye. Almost unnoticeable, but all the same. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, the believers who are still alive, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be cut up. Those two words, cut up, in the original language, is what translates to the rapture. To be caught away, to be translated, caught up together with them. So you see, they are not long gone before we are raptured. Resurrection, rapture, they are very close together. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then it says, wherefore? Comfort one another. Comfort for those who have lost their loved ones. And they're sorrowful. When you visit them, when you touch their lives, when you see them, comfort them. Console them with the word of scripture. And with this knowledge that you'll we'll see the loved ones again. Comfort one another. The people who are going through persecution, and it appears, will this ever end? The pain is too much. The pressure is too much. The persecution is becoming unbearable. Comfort them. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're looking at the word of God today on the rapture of Christ's sanctified bride. The rapture of Christ's 
sanctified bride. The church is referred to as the bride of Christ and is coming to take the bride away in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, looking at verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, betrothed you, have wooed you and won you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You see here, it's referring to Christ as the husband. Another word for that, the bridegroom. And it's referring to the church as a chaste virgin that has been won and that has been weaned from the world, separated from the world, severed from the world, and cleansed and made a virgin spiritually and then presented to Christ. Ephesians chapter 5. Talking about the church, the bride of Christ. It says in chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's talking about husbands and wives, and now it talks about Christ and the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it or the washing of water by the word, that he might present that church to himself, a glorious church. That's a virgin, that's a bride, that's a wife, not having sport or equal or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then he continues, talks about the husband and the wife. And then he tells us in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, that's the bride, has made herself ready. And to her, the wife, the bride, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The rapture of Christ's sanctified bride. We're looking at this under three perspectives. Number one, the rapture. Number two, the readiness. Number three, our responsibility. Number one, the rapture of steadfast saints at Christ's coming. Christ has assured us that he's coming again and is going to take the bride, the church, unto himself, away from the earth, away from the world, and will take the church to heaven. And that's referred to as rapture. And these that is coming for, they're not the sinners, they're saints. And they're steadfast saints because he said, Whosoever shall endure to the end, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved and will escape the torments and the torture of the great tribulation, the rapture of steadfast saints at Christ's coming. Number two the readiness of sanctified saints for his coming. Readiness of sanctified saints. Sanctification gets us ready. Holiness of heart, purity of heart, righteousness of life, total separation from the world, and loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind gets us ready for his coming. The readiness of sanctified saints for his coming. 
Number three, our responsibility towards sorrowful saints comfort. Our responsibility towards sorrowful saints comfort. We come to number one, the rapture of steadfast saints at Christ's coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here comes the word for resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Now the rapture. Then we which are alive, saved. Then we which are alive, abiding in Christ. Then we which are alive, were steadfast in a conviction that Christ is not only the Savior of the world, Christ is my Savior. And I'm retaining that salvation experience and I have him on the throne of my heart present all the time prominent on my heart preeminent on my heart it says we those that have Christ as Savior Christ as sanctifier and Christ lives in them and Christ moves in them, and Christ abides in them, and they abide in Christ, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then from the air, it takes us to the heavenly abode, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The scriptures assure us that the rapture will take place. Christ himself had promised, and that promise is going to fulfill. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51, it tells us in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. It was something hidden, hidden from the Old Testament people, Old covenant Israel and now it is revealed unto us and it says I show you a mystery before it was shown it was a mystery before it was revealed it was a mystery before it was unveiled it was a mystery before he touched them exposed it to them still hidden it was a mystery but now that is revealed it's no more a mystery it's no more something covered something hidden something unknown behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed it's talking about we who are alive alive in christ and steadfast in christ we're born again, and we're keeping that salvation experience. Our mind is focused on that. And it says, here it is, that we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the trump of God, at the trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And then we, talking about those who are alive, alive in Christ, alive in righteousness. And we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. It's saying that when that rapture takes place, our body will become the glorified body. And the force of gravity will not have any power, any pull on us anymore because we're changed, we're transformed, 
and then we're taken to heaven alive. And if anybody wonders, how can that happen? It happened before to Enoch. How can that happen? It happened before to Elijah. How can that happen? That's how Jesus went in the presence of his own disciples, taking up to heaven. Look at the case of Enoch. We're looking at Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. And Enoch walked with God. That means he walked in the light. He received the light of the word of God. He walked in that light. He walked in the light of the coming judgment of God. He tells us in Jude. He says the Lord will come with ten thousands of his saints. And is going to judge the world, the world of wickedness. He walked in the light. The judgment is coming. And he wanted to escape that judgment. It says, and Enoch walked with God. He walked with the God of truth. He had the truth of God. And he walked in that truth. And he's telling us, he's representing the people who are walking in the light. In the light of the knowledge of the truth. They're walking in the light. In the light of Christ. In the light of the world. They're walking in the light of the knowledge of the coming fulfillment of prophecy. And it says, he not walked with God. After he begat Methuselah, 300 years, this consistently walking with God. This constantly walking with God. This is uh, totally with conviction, walking with the Lord. This with consecration, total abandonment unto the Lord. He walked with the Lord consistently. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not... For God took him. He experienced the rapture before his time. So that the people of the world will know that when God has promised that the rapture is going to take place, it will happen. In Hebrews chapter 11, referring back to what happened to Enoch and giving us an explanation of how that happened. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, By faith Enoch, not by unbelief, by faith Enoch, not by wavering, by faith Enoch, not by doubting, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Many things happen in life that makes people to waver. But please remember, that the rapture is for the people who are steadfast in their faith. Not the people who are doubting, will he come, will he not come? Can I take it easy now? Can I yield to temptation? Can I go back into the world a little and then later come back? After all, they'll be talking about this coming. Enoch, by faith, walked with God. By faith, knowing that what God has said will surely come to pass, he did not, and he did not know. The Lord did not tell him when he was to be taken away. But faith, living by faith every day, walking by faith every day, and doing everything he did by faith every day. He saw the world going the way they were going. But then he stood firm and steadfast. I pray God will help us to be steadfast. By faith, Enoch was translated that he shouldn't see death. And was not. Because God had translated him. That's the rapture right there. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And that's what he's going to take for us to experience that rapture. Well, the people of God is not going to take the visible church. Now, when we talk about the church, there's a visible church. There's the denominational church. There's the ecumenical church. There is, uh, you know, the church on your street. And there are people that go in there every day of worship. It's not talking about that. It's talking about an inner circle inside the bigger circle. He's talking about the saints of God, the church of God. He's talking about those whose names are written in heaven. He's talking about the people who are walking consistently in the day, in the night. 
It's talking about the people during the week and on Sunday. Every time they are walking with the Lord like Enoch walk with the Lord. And they walk by faith. Sage by faith sanctified by faith living by faith and reading the word of god developing their faith and depending and trusting having confidence in the lord they're yeah, having faith in the lord every time that's what he's talking about and he says by faith enoch was translated so that you will know by faith so and so such and such will be translated that they should not see death and will not be found because God will translate them. But before their translation, they must have this testimony that they please God. That's what it will take. I said it happened to, to Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, reading from verse 3. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came, they came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? These people had knowledge or were ignorant. They didn't prepare. Elijah was going. And these have been the prophet of fire, the prophet of power. The prophet that turned the minds of the people in the nation back to God. And the prophet that gave evidence that he was a servant of the Lord, standing in the presence of the Lord. And whatever he said, he said, according to my word, this will happen or that will not happen. And it was so. And he was going away. And there was nobody that prepared who stands in the place of Elijah. There was nobody that thought about this and all this brought the knowledge. But this is superficial knowledge. This is knowledge that did not affect their lives. Do you know, knowest thou, that the Lord will take away, it's not Satan, the Lord will take away, that's the rapture, away from thy head today. And he said, yea, I know it, hold your peace. Your life becomes sober if you're really waiting for the coming of the Lord. I know it. Hold your peace. You'll not be frivolous. You'll not be talkative. You'll not be a person that just talks away your life and talks away the treasure in your life. Verse 5, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou? that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today. These people now, another group of um, sons of the prophets, they also had the knowledge, knowledge in the head, mental assent, that did not affect their behavior, their life, did not affect their desires, did not affect their coming back to the Lord in full consecration and total dedication and surrounding themselves to the Lord knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today they knew he was righteous like you know that's why God was going to take him away and nobody said how can I be that righteous so that this favor and this privilege will be mine as well and Elisha answered he answered yea I know it hold your peace there may be people that have the same doctrine as you have. They know the same teaching as you know. And they even talk about it more than you talk about it. But they aren't getting ready. They are not steadfast. And they aren't giving the, themselves to the Lord. But you must do like Elisha did. And something good will happen to you. Amen. Look at verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over. That Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elijah knew he was going to be taken away. He was going to experience the rapture. And he believed. He believed. He believed it. You see, there are people that hear about the rapture and they don't really believe it. 
They can quote where it is in the scriptures. They don't really believe it. All the people may know about it and may even tell them they don't really believe it. And you can tell with their lives. You can tell how they behave and you can tell they are not steadfast in the Lord. How they were yesterday, how they are today. How they are today is how they are going to be tomorrow. Whatever they hear, whatever service they attend, nothing changes. In the case of Elijah, Elijah knew that was going away and he had set everything right. There was nothing of the past that bothered him. There was nothing of the present that could hold him down. And now he was telling Elisha, as what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. He knew he was going away. And we know where we're going. I said we know where we're going. But then we don't know the time or the date. But we know it's going to happen. That's why you prepare yourself every day. And in verse 11, and it came to pass. And they still went on and talked. That behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. And horses of fire. And parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a wild wind. Where? Tell me out loud. Into heaven. Is there heaven? Are we going to get to heaven? Yes. Is it a better place than this place? Yes. Then prepare. We're looking at John. In John chapter 14. Here is the promise of the Lord himself. Concerning his coming again to take his people away. John chapter 14. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Look at this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Is he coming again? Yes. And he's coming for the church. Coming for his own. That's why I said, let not your heart be troubled. Persecution might be there. The pain of opposition might be there. But have a focused mind. That you know that this is what you're expecting. The world may be in turmoil. The sea may roar. Opposition may rise. Persecution may be intense and furious and fiery. But all the same, let not your heart be troubled. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And that happened to Christ himself after he rose from the dead. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up. He was with them. He had risen from the dead. He appeared unto, unto them. So that he will show them. He told them he was going to rise from the dead. And now that he rose from the dead, he appeared to them and showed them with many infallible proofs that it is I myself. And now on this day, it was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward where? Where did he go? Heaven. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as they went up, behold, he, two men, two angels, stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, talking to the disciples, the apostles, why stand ye here, gazing up into, tell me, into heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken off from you into, tell me, into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into, tell me, into heaven. He went to heaven. Is coming back again. And then the rapture will take place. It's going to prepare a place for us. 
We're going to be there in Jesus' name. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our conversation, that word conversation means our citizenship. Our names are written in heaven. Our conversation, citizenship, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. It says, it's coming back from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able is our God able? He is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It's coming again. You'll be a partaker in Jesus' name. Now point number two is our readiness. In uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Our readiness, the readiness of sanctified saints for his coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we, which are alive, alive physically, yes. Alive spiritually, yes. Alive alert. And we're conscious of the fact that this place is not our home. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Who are these we that will be caught up together with those who rise from the dead at the time of the rapture? First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 verse 28. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And now, little children, talking to believers, John was in his 90s at this time, an aged man, and he spoke to all the others, little children. There are times he used little children generally for everybody else, apart from himself, the whole church. Other times when he wants to see little children and then the uh, younger people and then the fathers, then he'll make demarcation, difference between them. But when he's talking generally to the old church, he was alive when Christ was alive. And about more than 60 years now, Christ had gone away. And all the people that are coming to the faith, he just called them little children. And he says, and now little children abide in him. That when he shall appear, is saying, abide in him. Don't backslide. Remain in him. Stay in the Lord. Abide in him. Abide in the light. Abide in righteousness. So that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him. Tell me those last words there. At his coming. At his coming. We abide so that we will not be ashamed. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Wherefore, therefore, the world knoweth us not. I want us to repeat all that together. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Say that aloud. Therefore, the world knoweth us Say that again. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. When you try that the world will know you, you're going to do some things that might hinder you from making it on the final day. Politics. Worldliness. And the things of the world that instead of saying, I want heaven to know me, I want Christ to know me, I want to be ready for the coming of the Lord, I want to have 
that righteousness and that holiness. If you have that righteousness and holiness, that will get you ready for the time of the coming of the Lord. The world is not going to appreciate that. They are going to honor that. They need to appreciate Christ. They need to appreciate Paul the Apostle. They need to appreciate the believers. He said, I've called you out of the world. And since he has called you out of the world, and he has reserved you to himself, consecrated you to himself, severed you from the world, so that you can be totally, entirely for the Lord. If you now want to go back, because you want to have some political uh, influence, you want the world to know you, you do a lot of things that might hinder you from getting uh, ready for the rapture. And what shall you profit a man? What shall you profit a woman? If he or she gains the whole world and then loses his own soul, I pray you'll be wise. Verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It's not talking about the world knoweth us not. Talking about the church. It's a danger save for the individual believer. To want to peace the world. And to want to be accepted by the world. So that you can win whatever title, whatever honor, whatever position. Becomes more dangerous for the whole church. Us. The world knoweth us not. When well, the church now tries to do things so that we manage our doctrine, we moderate our teaching, we moderate our lifestyle, and we moderate everything we do so that the world will accept us and appreciate us and will forget the Lord who has called us. The whole church might go astray and not be ready for the coming of the Lord. But I pray you will be ready. I will be ready. And this church will be ready. Yeah. I said this church will be ready. Yeah. The world outside there, the world is under the control of Satan. And the church is under the control of Christ, the bride of Christ. And when you do things to please the world, actually you do things to please the, the devil, Satan, so that Satan will appreciate, that means you've gone astray. The world will appreciate, that means you've gone astray. And when Christ comes, that church is lost. I pray this church will not be lost. Amen. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear. That's the rapture there. We shall be like him. Because we're going to be changed. We're going to be transformed. But we shall see him as he is. And we get ready. Verse 3. And every man, every person, every woman, every saint, every child of God, and everyone that has this hope in him, purifies himself. How? Tell me out loud. Uh, you know the people that say, Abraham did this. And so they think they can do that. That's another error. David did this. So I think I can do that. That's another time. The other past period that is gone. But now, in this dispensation, this special dispensation of the people who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, it says to swap the hope in them, the hope of the rapture, and the hope of making it in that day. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, reading here from verse 1. Talking about the readiness of sanctified saints for his coming. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, 
seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's how to be ready. The pool of the world is so much on the disciples of Christ today, on the followers of Christ today. It's like the world is doing this, I must do it. The world is getting on this way, I must get on that way. The world is cutting corners, and this is how they cut corners, this is how they get rich, I must do it. The world is running after this, and this is how they make it in life, and they can make a mark in the world. I want to do it to you. He said, no, forget who you are. I don't forget that as children of God, especially in these last days, we're waiting for the coming of the Lord, if ye then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God, but still set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above. Be thinking about heaven. Be planning to get to heaven. Be checking up every day, every morning when you have your quiet time. Should the Lord come today? Am I ready? Something is happening between you and so and so. And they want to turn it to a worldly kind of conflict and contention. We're going to get it from you. We're going to take it from you. And then since they fight, you also begin to fight. On those earthly uh, things, you say, I will not let this go. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. But this, oh, you want to fight? Well, fight it to finish. Look at verse 2. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Not on things on the earth. If you're a business partner with those people of the world, you're going to have a lot of trouble. They don't think about heaven. They don't think about hell. They don't think about being lost. And they don't think about righteousness. All they want is get the major part of that enterprise to themselves. And if you get involved with the people of the world, or those who say they are Christians but they are backsliders, all they are thinking about is the sin of the world. They, will, they are not setting their mind, their heart on the things on high, but on things of this world, and they're going to influence you. It's either you separate from them or cut the cord so that whatever little thing you're doing, you do it with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And don't allow the pull of the people of the world to influence you and make you to lose this thing we're talking about. I will not miss it in Jesus' name. That's why it says in verse 3, set your affection. Pin your affection. Concentrate your affection. Focus your attention. Direct your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I pray you'll make it in Jesus' name. If you are going to make it, you have to be setting your mind, your gaze, your affection, your attention on things above. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. You're looking for it. You're desiring it. You're passionate for it. You're pursuing it. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and a Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. What kind of people? What kind of people? A peculiar people, zealous of good works. Well, as did you remember, you are supposed to be peculiar in your office. Everybody is doing it. Stand out, be peculiar. And then you see all these uh, passions on the street, on the streets of our city. Everybody is wearing that, stand out, be peculiar. And you see the way people are acting. How did I want to assert my authority? 
and they want to, you know, they put pressure on the, you know, whoever is in authority so that they will cower down. They will kind of oppress and, and bow down. All the people that should have been directing them. That's how they do it in all those institutions. Stand out, be peculiar. You see, those who join them, and those who act like them, and those who live like them, and those who backslide into the world, and those who behave like the world, who do not stand out, peculiar, sanctified, holy, righteous, different, distinct, they're going to miss it on the final day. But it says, who gave themselves for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself, not purify unto the world. It's not purifying us to donate us to the world. It's not purifying us to donate us to politics. It's not purifying us to donate us to the system of the land. So that it says, I'm donating you to them. No, he purifies unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I pray you'll be totally heart, soul, mind, and spirit belong to the Lord in Jesus' name. You see how weak that amen is? Yeah. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, talking about Christ and the church. And it's talking about how we ought to get ready. And it's a sanctified heart, sanctified life, sanctified mind, sanctified action, sanctified thought, sanctified imagination, sanctified personality that gets us there. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Can we read that again? If you're preparing for the rapture, how many times will forget? We forget, we relegate this rapture to the time when the service. We relegate the rapture to the time when we're reading the Bible. Relegate the rapture to the time when we are particularly religious at the retreat, at the conference, at the congress. But you know, at home, there's a way a sanctified husband will behave. At home, there is a way a sanctified wife who is waiting for the coming of the Lord. There's a way she will behave. You see, in the places of work, there's a way that sanctified employers, sanctified employees who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, there's a way they will act. But when we leave sanctification in the church, and we leave the experience in our chamber, in our precious chamber where we pray. And then when we go to the market, we have left the sanctification at home. And when we go to the office, we have left the sanctification at home. What if the rapture happens when you're in the office? And then you forgot sanctification at home is the doctrinal part of you that you live in a corner preciously wrapped up in the corner of the chamber. We take it everywhere. And in the family it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ. Also, love the church. Of course, the other side is also true. You cannot tell me as a wife, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And then you are angry at your husband. And you are nagging at your husband. And you are abusive to your husband. And you have animosity and hatred, malice with your husband. What if the Lord came at that time? Sanctification is not something that will relegate to a corner of our life. It is something that permeates. It's something that saturates. It's something that totally invades on our lives. That's why it says, husbands, love your wives. Brothers and sisters, if we did this, our pastors will not be settling quarrel between husband and wife. Already, they're sanctified. How do you, how do you settle quarrels for sanctified people? How do you settle conflict between sanctified people? If we were preparing for the rapture, we'll not be wasting hours 
between that brother, so-called brother, and the other so-called brother. I, I will not take that. I will not take that. If we were sanctified ready for the rapture, all that will not be there. If we were sanctified, we'll not be kind of, you know, oppressing each other, opposing each other, and the wife will not be complaining. How is it you are doing enough money? I see from the primary school, secondary school child, and I earn the money. And because we are talking about joint account, then you are, you know, watch the church should look at this so that we women will not be suffering. If we were getting ready for the rapture, you will open your hand and you make the money available. After all, it's joint account. Husbands, love your wives. We're going to do it. I can't hear my men. Women, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. I'm told you are doing it already. Keep on doing more. Don't get tired. Don't get to worry. Don't say, the more I do, the more I love the man. Look at the way he's behaving. Okay, I'm stopping. You cannot stop loving your husband if you are waiting for the rapture. I'm talking to my the daughters there. I said you cannot stop. What are the daughters? Can you stop your hand? Are you going to stop loving your husband? And those of you who don't have husbands yet, I'm praying for you. They are coming before Christ comes, perhaps. Yeah. Say good amen if you believe that. Yeah. He says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also love the church. And he gave, what did he give? Himself. If you can give yourself, you'll give money. If you give yourself, you'll give time quality time that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself what kind of church tell me out loud look up here for a moment you know there's no point just reading 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 the bible and then we don't understand the bible if there is hatred between you and i and we are part of this church there's no glorious church if there is a malice between you and I, I'm just not me really, I'm talking between you and another member, and there's no glorious church. If there's something we're keeping secret, don't let, uh, you know, the coordinator hear that, don't let uh, so-and-so hear that, and there's no glorious church. If we're doing something, hide and seek. I'm, you know, hiding myself away from you. You are hiding yourself away from me. I don't want you to know that I'm the one that said that. I'm the one that did that. And I'm talking to another person. Deal with that fellow. Handle him this way. Don't let him know I told you. There's no glorious church. If we're doing hide and seek, if we're cheating each other, if we're defrauding each other, if we're taking away what belongs to another person, and then we do it so uh, carefully in a fraudulent way, there's no glorious church. And if it is like on that pew, on that pew, on that pew, and everywhere, and it's like the holiness we're talking about, it's not a transparent holiness, and it doesn't show when we get back to the district and when we get back to where we're coming from that's not a glorious church we're not ready yet we're going to get ready i said we're going to get ready that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any saucy but that it should be holy you know, when you're a preacher, say, in our church, if they're talking about holiness, and they have to cover the corner of their mouth before they talk about holiness, and they have to take something away from that holiness so that it will not hurt anybody, and we have to make it superficial so it will not get deep in the heart of the people, it will not pierce them, it will not pinch them, and it will not kind of uh, trouble them, and we have to, you know, carefully, methodically go through the message of holiness without making it to affect brother so and so and sister so and so there's no holiness there the one we are tailoring and the one we are adjusting and the one we are modifying so that it will not affect so and so that's not holiness but that christ died for the church and christ shared his blood he wants to cleanse us and purge us and purify us so that it should be holy and without blemish it will happen it will happen to everyone, like in the good old days, in Jesus' name. We're coming back to First Thessalonians, and I'm reading from chapter 4. I'm reading from First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Point number three now, our responsibility towards sorrowful saints, 
comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, the ministry of consolation, the ministry of consoling other people, the ministry of comforting other people, the ministry of caring for other people. Our responsibility towards sorrowful saints comfort. And let's look at Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. We're reading from verse 34. In Job chapter 21 and verse 34, it says, How then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remaineth falsehood. The first thing we're learning is if there is a false doctrine, you cannot comfort another person with false doctrine. You cannot give somebody hope on the basis of false doctrine. If there is the truth in your heart, but I can't tell this truth, it will jolt him. It will disturb him. And then I go superficially, oh, sorry about this, your condition. Sorry about this that you are going through. I hope and I pray this will not happen to you anymore. You don't believe what you're saying because you know the cause of the problem. And you know the problem is still there. And the problem has not been removed. And the root of the situation is still there. And then superficially you're saying, sorry about this condition. That's no comfort. That's why it says over here, how then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remaineth falsehood. We're looking at Genesis and we're looking at chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And we're looking at verse 35. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. We're talking about Jacob here. And all the sons of Jacob. They came to comfort Jacob because Joseph, his beloved son, was assumed killed by a wild animal. They didn't actually say that, but you know, they sold the Jacob into slavery. And they did that garment in the blood of animal. And they came to Jacob to say, we saw this cloth. You can see the duplicity there. You can see the deception there. We saw this cloth. You see, it this for your child. This is my child's cloth. My child is no doubt torn by an, a wild animal. They didn't say no. They knew the truth. And now Jacob become, became so sorrowful because my son is dead. My son is dead. Because of that sorrow of heart, all the sons and all the daughters, they rose up to comfort him and he refused to be comforted. That comfort will not work. When you are the one causing the injury, you are the one hurting that fellow, and you are the one that is causing that calamity. And then, but the man does not know, the woman does not know, that brother did not know, that sister did not know, that you are the cause of the calamity. You are the one hindering his marriage. You are the one hindering her marriage. And you are the one that have put your feet down behind the curtain and behind the closed door. As long as I'm here, this man will not get through this one. And then the fellow is not suffering. He doesn't know the cause of his problem. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then I'm a pastor, I'm a coordinator, I'm a woman leader. And I, you know, we have to comfort each other. You know that it is no comfort here. We're going to solve that problem. Just go behind and remove the thing you're tied. And just go behind and remove all the hindrances you put on his way. That will be comfort. But as these people came, Jacob refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son morning. Thus his father wept for him. 
and he wept continually. If we're going to comfort other people, there'll be sincerity. We're going to comfort other people, there'll be truth. We're going to comfort other people, there'll be genuine, true spirit love. We love him. We love him. We don't want him to suffer. How is he suffering like this? If we could, we'll give a very life, sincerely, honestly, so that all his troubles will be over. I pray that genuine, transparent comfort will come from our hearts to people around us in Jesus' name. I want a good, better. Amen. Amen. We're looking at Psalm 119, Psalm 119. And I'm reading here from verse 48. Psalm 119, and we're looking at verse 48. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort, the word, the word. Remember the word, remember the word unto thy servant. When you are going to comfort people, go with the word, the word of promise. Go with the word, the word of faith. Go with the word, the word of hope. Go with the word, the word of Christ, the word of love. This is my comfort in my affliction for thy word as quickened me is the word that will quicken the people in a uh, second corinthians chapter one second corinthians chapter one we're reading from verse three second corinthians chapter one reading here from verse three the ministry of comfort in second corinthians chapter one verse three blessed be god even the father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and the father of all tell me comfort who comforteth us in all our afflictions that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of god you see that there you go with experience if you yourself, you've gone through that situation. Somebody's bereaved, you have been bereaved before. And in your bereavement, you know the word of God that brought you out of that dungeon and that a pit of despair. And you've come alive now, you're excited about life, and you're working for the Lord, and you know you're going to see your loved one on the other side eventually. And then you go with that word of comfort. It happened to me before. And this is what helped me, that's what helped me. Or if, uh, you know, somebody had miscarriage, and then she's, uh, you know, so unhappy, you know, that child was this month old, and look at what has happened now, and you're going to comfort the person if it had happened to you before. You will not protect your personality and protect your image. I will not allow them to know that this ever happened to me before, and then you go with dry counseling, dry comfort. Come out of your shell and say, my sister, you know what? How old did you say that baby was before you lost the baby? This one, uh, can I tell you my experience? This happened to me, and then the other sister opens her mouth. Uh, that happened to you? I thought nothing like this ever happens to good people. I thought because it happened to me, I'm a backslider. Not necessarily, it happened to me, and you know, this is the word God gave me. That's the word God gave me. That one will have more effect than any theory that is trying to comfort people. The Lord has comforted you, comfort other people. With the same comfort that the Lord has given you. And I pray that your ministry of comfort will be effective in the lives of people in Jesus' name. And he's telling us that if you're going through any situation now, the God of comfort will comfort you. And if you're going through any challenge, that challenge will soon be over. And there's any tithe, any, any predicament there, the Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10 of that, uh, for 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Look at this, who delivered us, past tense, he has delivered us. We've seen a lot of people going through the same thing you are going through now. God delivered them, your own time has come. And he says, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver
deliver us. God delivers us in the present tense. He did it before. Every miracle he did for all the people before, he'll do it for you at the present time. He took away the yokes of other people before he take your own away. He broke the yokes and he broke all the shackles in the past. He did it before. He will do it today in Jesus' name. He wiped up the tears of the saints of old. He will wipe up your tears away in Jesus' name. Look at the word. Look at the word deliver. Who delivered us, pastors, from so great a death? And God deliver us. That's uh, now in a uh, present tense. And in whom we trust that he will tell me. Present, past, future, he'll yet deliver us before that coming day of the Lord and before that time of the rapture. No matter what you go through, the Lord will deliver you. Amen. There is a promise in the word of God for every problem you have. Identify the problem, identify the promise, bring them together. Deliverance has come for you. Amen. And the Lord will keep you until that day. He will establish you until that day. Remember, there's no temptation that will ever come to you. Greater than you can bear. God will make a way of escape. You will escape in Jesus' name. And when that trumpet shall sound, and then the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord forever. When the saints go marching in, you'll be there, I'll be there, we'll be there in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and tell the Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I'll be there. You'll be there. We'll be there together. He wants us to comfort each other. He wants us to encourage each other. He wants us to exhort each other. He wants us to hold each other's hand. Somebody is getting tired. Somebody is getting weary. You're holding their hand so that by the grace of God, all of us together will make it on that final day. Brother, cheer up, you'll make it. Sister, cheer up, you'll make it. Comfort, deliverance is coming your way.